everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of Women Talk. We'll be talking about the intersection of telehealth and pain management, a conversation that we hope will be as interesting as it is informative. Telehealth quite literally has been a lifeline for many, especially those uh, who suffer from pain. The ease and flexibility of telehealth appointments have been especially useful for patients who need long-term frequent care, including chronic pain patients who are disabled or unable to travel uh, to their providers. Telehealth has also become a significant method for clinicians to use uh, telehealth visits to discuss treatment options carefully with their patients, especially their female patients. As always, communication between patient and provider, whether in person or via video, is essential for effective care. So today we have uh, asked Kate Nicholson, the Executive Director of National Pain Advocacy Center, and Dr. Anita Gupta, an adjunct assistant professor of anesthesiology and critical care uh, medicine and pain medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine to join us to dig into this topic further. Both are experts in their field and have extensive experience and wisdom to share. With that, I would like to jump into a few questions that we have for Kate and Anita. So Kate and Anita, welcome to the program today. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great, great to have you both here. So let's start off the conversation on, on telehealth just broadly. So um, this question is to both for both of you, but Anita, why don't we go with your uh, view as a physician? So how has telehealth changed for better over the last few, uh, last several years? First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, Monica, and, for, and Healthy Women, uh, really to talk about uh, the pandemic and also uh, telehealth uh, and for what's happened during the pandemic. Um, first of all, you know, what we know right now is that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to be a serious issue for many people uh, throughout the world and particularly here in the United States. Um, one of the key issues that many communities, uh, individuals, and patients are experiencing is access to health care. Uh, and what we have found uh, is that approximately during the peak of the pandemic, that 30% of patients, according to research, were utilizing telehealth as access to health care, as their primary access to health care. And this is critical information uh, because what we know is that patients need access to health care to prevent, uh, to educate, and to, to recover from their conditions. Uh, many people were not able to get the care that they needed. Um, and being a pain provider, knowing and understanding the complexity of the conditions that many of these patients endure, particularly women, uh, it's critical that we provide um, appropriate access through, whether it be telehealth or other avenues um, to give them the care that they desperately need. Thanks, Anita. That's great because access is such an issue when it comes to women, you know, uh, trying to get their care. So definitely, that that's a very positive message. Kate, uh, what are your what's your take on this? Sure, I, I certainly agree with uh, with Anita. Um, in some ways, the COVID pandemic was a great experiment for all of us. Um, necessity proved the mother of invention. Um, and we had to pivot and figure out how to make healthcare accessible to people when services were closed down. And particularly with respect to people in pain, um, non-essential services that were deemed non-essential are often treatments that people use to keep their pain at an equilibrium whether that be physical therapy um, or interventional techniques. Um, and obviously some of those uh, like interventional techniques were still inaccessible, but um, telehealth really, really stepped in for people. Um, and it proved useful, um, not just for immediate access, but also for people with chronic pain who have difficulty, many of whom with nobility or for whom the medical slog going to an appointment um, actually increases their pain, even though they're going for treatment and reduction of pain. So I think it proved incredibly helpful. Um, and particularly so for people, women with childcare responsibilities who might have had challenges getting um, to providers, uh, people from rural areas who ordinarily would have had to travel long distances for appointment could be seen, you know, in their home. Um, people with trans transportation barriers also had that privilege. Um, so it was very helpful in those senses. Um, 
of course, there were still some some services that were not accessible, um, and we do have to be mindful of uh, the digital divide and the fact that broadband services aren't widely available for all people. Not everyone has a computer, and so it's that's why it was also important to have um, audio only um, telehealth or virtual care rather um, available to people as well. Yeah, that's great because you pointed out certain populations and also that some things that we've taken for granted, right? The video aspect and, and the broadband service. So that's great. So Anita, let's uh, discuss a bit about the a recent survey that you did of healthcare providers on telehealth. And, um, and so tell us a bit about the survey, why you did that and also the key takeaways. And plus, were there any gender differences that you saw that came to the survey, if there were any? Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I have to give credit to the team of researchers and students at Princeton University uh, that worked very closely. During the peak of the crisis, uh, we worked together uh, to really identify and learn um, what, what telehealth meant uh, for many people who had pain uh, and, and what it meant during this urgent need uh, to access health care that was equitable, uh, to populations that were not able to get the care that they needed. But what we quickly uncovered is that healthcare professionals, physicians, pharmacists, although they're very willing to utilize this modality and in innovation, they just did not have perhaps the level of comfort uh, to utilize it to treat complex patients. So we, we quickly did a survey, uh, a pilot study to assess their level of comfort their ability to communicate uh, opioid education, prevention, uh, and their level of awareness uh, and skills to communicate through telehealth modalities and, and really to treat patients. And what we uncovered is that it is very similar and if not better, potentially, potentially, um, as you know, traditional methods of taking care of patients. Um, now, this was a pilot study. We had a very small population of patients, uh, and, and it was very preliminary results, but it is promising, uh, and we do hope to do more uh, research. But what it does indicate is that there is a possibility that telehealth and other uh, innovation in this area could hold promise uh, to help these patients that desperately need care, particularly uh, who suffer from pain, who need medication guidance, particularly related to opioid therapy. Uh, and we know uh, that the opioid crisis continues uh, to be a serious matter, uh, not only for prescription drugs, but illicit use. And there's a significant need for education in this area uh, for many populations of patients that just simply don't have access to care. So that sounds very promising. and. Uh... Uh, people can access your paper right now if they want to, right? And we can give a link to that. Correct. Uh, um, yeah. Correct. It is available uh, on healthpivot.org, and there will be a potentially further publication on it uh, in the next several months. And we're we're very excited to release it through many organizations. And uh, we thank you for sharing it through this community as well. Thank you. So Kate, uh, moving on, uh, what aspects of uh, telehealth uh, would you like to see remain and what did you feel uh, still did not work? So let's put this in context with people living with chronic pain and anything that you would like to add specific to women. And again, we're talking in context of also COVID where the telehealth has just, you know, uh, the use of telehealth has expanded. So, um, so yeah, tell us a bit more about that. Sure. I, I think a lot of things worked really well. When you talk about people with chronic pain and COVID, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. someone who is severely immune compromised with chronic pain um, and got COVID very early in the pandemic when it first came to, to Colorado um, and was able to be treated really well through, through telehealth. I had a pulse oximeter at home uh, that could measure, you know, the oxygen that I was getting. Um, and you know, was able to meet with my provider every day on screen and check in. Um, and it would have been difficult to have someone, you know, take me to my provider, not only because of exposing my provider, but also not wanting to expose someone else um, in, in a car. So um, I think a lot of the routine care 
proved incredibly useful. The thing that I've heard um, from a lot of people about that that didn't perhaps work as well um, were services like uh, physical therapy. Not that they weren't useful um, to, ha to have as an option um, in an ongoing way, but I have had people say to me, you know, when I actually went back to see my provider in person, turns out I was doing some of the exercises wrongly. And I think it's just because, you know, you don't have cameras uh, all over your, your house so that uh, a provider can see different parts of someone's someone's body, acupuncture, you know, chiropractic, obviously things that require, um, you know, hands-on care, um, like interventions were, were less available. Um, but it, it provided a really important bridge and, and it's one that we need to continue um, because it does provide a level of access to care that we don't see uh, necessarily throughout the healthcare system. So it's incredibly important. And because it was an experiment, we sort of know what what worked and what hasn't worked, mm -hmm. um, and what we need to do to pivot. You know, um, a lot of my friends who are educators had to learn how to give their class in a different way online. It didn't just work to to do exactly the same thing. And so I think we can innovate um, and uh, think about those things going forward. But the things that also didn't work that I think we have to be conscious of. Um, uh, first of all, we need to make sure that the services are accessible um, in terms of communication. If someone required an interpreter in person, they're going to also require captioning or an interpreter um, through telehealth. But also there are real privacy considerations that were, were waived during uh, the pandemic because of necessity, but there may be you know, women who have children in the home or family members who, who really shouldn't be hearing um, sensitive health information or overhearing. There may be women who experience domestic violence um, uh, for whom you know, sort of overhearing information is, is an issue. So I think it's really important to be conscious of uh, you know, the benefits, but also the limitations of the medium. And I think there might be also people who are still comfortable going into the doctor's office. So I think it's just a combination of perhaps the telehealth and again, what works for, you know, what, you know, some, the telehealth might work very well for one person and may not for others. But again, the opportunity is there to be able to decide how they want to pursue care. Yeah, and that's something we want to see happen as coverage, you know, yeah. as we look into what's covered and what isn't, is continued audio only for people who don't have broadband access, the continued ability to go into the provider if that's, you know, what the patient desires. Great. Um, so one of the things, you know, the, a couple months ago, uh, CDC re released, um, you know, prescribing guidelines for opioids. And Anita, you touched a bit about, you know, opioids in, in your study that you did. Um, surprisingly, they did not uh, address the topic of telehealth in the prescribing guidelines. And the, these are the draft guidelines that were released again by CDC in February. So um, tell us, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, again, that was, as I said, a bit surprising um, not to see that. Well, look, first of all, I think uh, Kate mentioned a little bit, there are drawbacks uh, with any new technology or new innovation, and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, this is new. We moved very quickly during the pandemic, and we continue to. Uh, but innovation has challenges. Uh, there are lack of available evidence-based information still. There is a significant digital divide that still has to be established, you know, across multiple populations. While we're giving access to some, who are we not including? And, you know, there is also confusing insurance reimbursement matters that have not been clarified on the state and federal level. Um, we are continuing to evaluate those, but still patients are sometimes left behind. Uh, and we have to understand how consumers are impacted by that. Uh, and there's not clarity from the healthcare provider's level of familiarity. Uh, so when we talk about guidelines and best practices for a complex crisis, we're not there yet. Uh, and I think implementing that, we just can't do that right just yet, particularly with the new innovation. Um, I know that there are additional insights and factors that will be taken into consideration, um, particularly when we took, look at ease of use, we look at usefulness, uh, we look at other factors, many, many value-based care. Uh, but I certainly hope that it will be included 
Uh, and obviously we look at the human to human connection, which is probably the most critical. Uh, patients ultimately feel healed when they are with the provider face to face and how that will be addressed in the future is of critical importance. Uh, we know with evidence that patients get significant uh, healing when they're in the presence of another individual or a physician or a clinician. Uh, so that, that has to be taken to account too. Mm -hmm. Kate? Like sure. Um, well, as you know, uh, Monica, the, the draft guideline was over 200 pages long already. Um, it included a lot of information. And I, I would really concur in what Anita said about, um, you know, us still being in the experimental phase right now, particularly with respect to opiate prescribing, which is what nominally that guideline covers, although it actually addresses a lot of other treatment modalities as well. Um, you know, we did have an exception to um, the Ryan Haidt Act for opioid prescribing uh, during the public health emergency, which that, uh, so that act actually requires an in-person visit for opioid mm -hmm. prescribing, but it allows for exceptions during uh, public health crises. But that's only going to be, you know, um, in existence, at least so far, um, until the, you know, while the public health crisis is in effect. Uh, the Secretary mm -hmm. for Health and Human Services extended it from uh, the 16th of April. So we're still in the public health emergency and announced that they would let um, states and others know um, for 60 day, give us a sort of 60 day bridge period um, once they've ended it. But it is not at all clear that uh, opioid prescribing will even continue via telehealth after that period of time. There are other things that have been extended coverage wise, you know, by the administration, uh, particularly the Appropriations Act in 2020 um, that was signed uh, on the 15th of March. Um, uh, CMS, uh, Medicare has extended telehealth appointments um, it, it, that can be compensated, you know, from people for, in their home. Um, audio only telehealth and um, uh, the number of providers that can be uh, compensated uh, to include not just clinicians, but also, you know, phys uh, physical therapists, occupational mm -hmm. therapists, audiologists, um, and also, you know, uh, a study that will really examine what worked and what didn't, mm -hmm. um, which is all very helpful. Um, and I know that th this group is really focused on people uh, under 65, women 38 to 65, but it's important to be aware of what uh, CMS is doing because it ends up impacting what other, you know, what other payers uh, will pay for. So, so there's a lot of still information that we need to look forward to and see again if those guidelines do take telehealth into consideration. Uh, and so again, you know, we'll, we'll be following that. All right, so let's uh, open up uh, for questions uh, from the audience. Um, let me see if there are any questions here. Um, okay. So this question is from Caroline. Uh, I would love to hear their thoughts uh, on solutions for patients with COVID long haul uh, and that pain. Kate, do you wanna go first? Sure, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a really, really excellent question. I actually wrote an op-ed a few months ago about how uh, pain is one of the top three features of long COVID. Mm -hmm. And yet people with long COVID are having their pain dismissed or disregarded, just like women have uh, for, who have pain from other conditions. So it's a real issue, it's a real problem. Um, there are rehabilitation facilities in some locations um, that are just focused on long COVID and the Biden administration has since put out a plan on treating long COVID. So there are things in development um, from a public health uh, point of view that are, that are happening. But really when I talk to people uh, with long COVID, it, it, it's really similar to talking to anybody who just developed a chronic pain condition. Um, the adjustments, the the barriers in the healthcare system, the being disbelieved, the bewilderment of family and friends that this is happening. It really is very much a repetition of what um, happens to people who have had an accident or who have a disease that that causes long term pain. And uh, and people can find that article on Stat News. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, great. Uh, this question is from uh, Beth. What are the three things consumers can do to prepare for the telehealth visit? Anita? I can take that. that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, first, you know, the most important thing is if you if you have technology, make sure it works. <laughs> and yeah. test, test your technology before the visit. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges. You know, time is often limited during these visits. Um, you want to test your camera, test your audio, um, and make sure everything's working adequately. Number two, um, make sure you have your questions ready. Uh, these are some things that you can do even when you're going to see your clinician or healthcare professional or doctor. You know, these are critical things that you should have, uh, you know, prepared even for a telehealth visit. Uh, you know, asking those key questions can make sure that you hone in on what the issues are. Um, number three, medication-related questions should always be prepared. If you have refills, if you have something that you have specifically an adverse drug reaction that you're needing to ask about, have them prepared. Um, make sure that those are ready. Um, charge your device. <laughs> those are always very important. Uh, I think oftentimes, sometimes conversations can abruptly end. Uh, and lastly, make sure you're in a quiet uh, location and adjust your lighting uh, because a lot of times you can be disturbed by simple things, you know, during the visit. And you want to make sure you're in a quiet, peaceful area during that visit um, so you won't have any interruptions. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this question is from Christy. Uh, she says, So I'm hearing that an exception has been granted that does not require an in person appointment for opioid prescribing for the public health emergency, but is there discussion happening now about changing the guidelines permanently to allow controlled substances to be prescribed over telehealth? Kate, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure, yes, it's definitely being discussed, um, but uh, the exception was just for, um, for the public health emergency, and because it's a, a law, um, that allows for exceptions during public health emergencies who would actually require, you know, an, a, a change in the law um, to, to allow it. Now, um, prescribing for people with opiate use disorder um, ha has already had shifted under other laws. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, under the Support Act, um, uh, some of this barriers uh, across states and some of those things um, had already changed, but with respect to uh, opiate prescribing for pain, um, it's definitely an ongoing conversation. But um, as you know, as far as we know, that's not going to change um, except during the the public health emergency. So, Kate, can you just explain briefly on the barriers across state lines because our audience may not understand the challenges? Just very briefly. Oh, um, sure. So, one of the things that was sort of waived during the public health emergency. Um, is you know uh, whether someone can prescribe um, you know say you live in the Washington metro area um, and the states are all right next to each other and, and contiguous um, so there are coverage issues but there are also legal issues with prescribing uh, across um, state lines. Okay, great. Um, so next question uh, from Joy: When do I know I need to have an in-person appointment with my doctor versus a telehealth appointment? Anita? Yeah, sure. I think, look, you know, I think what's critical to know is that telehealth is really an opportunity to have a conversation. Physical examination is not complete with the telehealth, uh, you know, and really that is critical. If you feel that you're not getting better, your symptoms are not being, you know, treated or assessed appropriately, it's always best to have an in-person appointment. Uh, ultimately, the physical examination can be completed uh, in totality. So I think it's always best. And as I had said earlier, you know, look, ultimately face-to-face -face evaluations can't be replaced. Uh, and, and that is the challenge with telehealth is that how can we adequately assess patients or individuals, you know, with telehealth adequately? We, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, and so if you feel your symptoms are not being addressed or your physical examination is not complete, it's, too, it's best to see the doctor or healthcare professional in person. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a question here from Jamie. Do you find it much harder to diagnose invisible conditions like chronic pain via telehealth 
than any dermatological conditions that you can literally show on screen? And this is a good question because diagnosis is always complex or chronic pain. It takes sometimes years to diagnose chronic pain. So uh, it'd be great if, if you both can answer this. Um, so I don't know who wants to take this one first. I can jump in yeah. right here. Um, look, you know, pain is a complex condition. And, and given the, the complexity of diagnosis and understanding, you know, conditions, it, it can take sometimes a very long time of diagnostic process, which can require testing, imaging, interviewing, mm -hmm. reviewing of records, which often doesn't happen just on one visit. It could occur over multiple visits. Uh, and telehealth is not necessarily at this point in time necessarily allowing clinicians to do that in totality. And if it is, it may require multiple uh, telehealth visits. So I think it's something that we still have to really evaluate how to do this best. Uh, and I think we're not there yet uh, to really perfect this process. Uh, in person, we have gotten much better at doing it, uh, but we still haven't gotten there to do a, a physical examination diagnostic process and really go through the physical examination process to perfection. But is it possible? Potentially. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we get there? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something I saw um, happening more for, for patients, those who already had a care team, a diagnosis, you know, a treatment protocol, you know, their telehealth appointments went pretty seamlessly mm -hmm. um, if they didn't require interventional treatments or things that required in-person visits. But for those at the early stages um, who still had testing to do, um, you know, the pandemic really pushed it back and was a big problem for people. So, you know, it, again, you know, there are a lot of things we can do with virtual care um, and there are some things we just, we just can't. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, let's see. I believe uh, there's one other question. Uh, this is from Emily. Um, from policy perspective, is there anything that consumers can do to keep telehealth coverage and reimbursement? Have this come from someone else? Not me. Um, I can yeah, take can that. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I actually think it's really helpful to talk to your elected representatives um, because that's what it's going to, to take. Um, and uh, they are accessible to you. Um, I would call their staff and say, listen, telehealth is essential for me. Um, you need to make sure that these things that have worked well uh, continue. So um, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in people advocating directly with policymakers. All right. Well, um, this is great. And I think uh, our time's up. So let's wrap this up now. Well, thank you uh, for, uh, you know, I want to thank the audience for here for being here today uh, and asking all these questions. Uh, and uh, let's see, I think we have another episode of Women Talk coming up, but uh, that information, we, we're going to release it uh, soon. And uh, so keep a watch for that. And then again, thank you both, Kate and Anita, for taking time out of your busy schedules today to have this conversation with us. And uh, again, to our audience, thanks for joining. And we look forward to engaging with us on the next episode of Women Talk. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Women Talk. Stay tuned for more Healthy Women Live events at www.healthywomen.org. You can also follow us at Healthy Women on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or LinkedIn. Or follow us on Instagram at healthywomenorg. We'll see you next time.